uh, a bunch of us have been thinking about this subject. Uh, I was the leader of the group, started the group. Uh, John Baumgartner, uh, PhD in geophysics, was involved in our group. Russell Humphreys, a pure physicist with experience in um, earth magnetism, he was in our group. Uh, Andrew Snelling, a hard rock geologist, what we call an igneous and metamorphic petrologist, was in our group. And Larry Vardaman was in our group, a climatologist uh, and meteorologist. And uh, Dr. Kurt Wise, uh, a, uh, a paleontologist, was in our group. And we started meeting and talking about this issue of uh, plate tectonics and catastrophic plate tectonics. And over the years, we have uh, built uh, a kind of position statement that we think should influence our thinking and other people's thinking. And if you look at the Earth, you see something remarkable about it, remarkable about the Earth. We have two kinds of landforms on the Earth. We have continent, we have ocean floor. And so we should understand the continents and ocean floor. Do we have a projection pointer I can use? Uh, do we have one of those handy? Um, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll call your attention to most of the planet, about 70% of the planet, is ocean floor. And the ocean floor is um, lower elevation, about 12,000 feet above sea level. And then the continents are expressed above sea level, about 2,000 feet above sea level. That's remarkable. Well, I'll talk about the tectonics of the Earth, the tectonic models, various tectonic models, especially uh, because they go way back in the history of things. I'll talk to you about the pre-flood Earth. I'll talk about what was the physical cause of the global flood. Try to pose that question, ask it, and uh, give some answers. And then I'll try to think about uh, computer modeling plate tectonics. We believe it can be modeled in a catastrophic way. I'll talk to you about sediment transport mechanisms in the flood, a little bit about volcanoes and earthquakes, how the flood ended, the post-flood uh, geologic process, the post-flood climate, what we have today, and then uh, a little bit uh, draw some conclusions. Very good. Okay. So now I can, whoa, that's great. Okay. All right. Uh, there we go. We got the overview. Okay. Uh, tectonic models. You know, ancient literature way back uh, deals with tectonics. Plato's Atlantis, okay. Uh, lots of other... Uh, things uh, regarding uh, uh, ancient literature. The statements of scripture regarding uh, tectonics. Uh, the theory of Antonio Snyder. Remember Antonio Snyder? I explained last night the, uh, the author of catastrophic plate tectonics in 1859. Modern theories of continental drift and plate tectonics. Antonio Snyder's theory of continental sprint was slowed down to make the modern uh, theories of continental drift and plate tectonics. Well, ancient uh, literature uh, has a theme. Uh, the Gilgamesh epic and the Enuma Elish account in the Babylonian literature. Uh, Greek, uh, even uh, American Indian tribes have uh, tectonic uh, elements to them. Uh, what does scripture say about the formation of continents and ocean basins? Uh, Genesis 1 verse 9 says, God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And then it goes on to say, in the gathering together of the oceans, he called seas. Okay. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up in Genesis 7:11, a great tectonic event. The uh, fountains of the great deep, and then the were broken up. The Hebrew word is beka. Beka means to split open or cleave. And all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. You notice that the, the, the flood begins on the ocean floor, evidently, with the fountains of the great deep being broken up, and then it proceeds to the high hills uh, on the continents. All the high hills on the, uh, under the whole heaven were covered. And it's a Hebrew superlative. You cannot say it in a, in a more concise way that the floodwaters covered everything. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Antonio Snyder's map of the pre-flood Earth, the continents joined some way, and uh, the idea that the continents split apart as a result of the uh, flood. Um, La Creation Essays, Mysteries de Valier, published by Antonio Snyder, 1859. Bad year for plate tectonics, especially catastrophic plate tectonics, and publishing uh, 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 the flood uh, because uh, the world didn't want to hear 
more uh, catastrophic ways of thinking about the earth. They wanted to hear uniformitarian thinking. And of course, Darwin ascended uh, to popularity about that time. It wasn't until about 1910 that Alfred Wegener dusted off Snyder's theory of catastrophic plate tectonics and put it in an evolutionary uh, time scale involving millions of years. And then continental drift was ignored till 1963, right in there. And then, uh, then seafloor evidence became available to suggest that the giant uh, mountain range around the, the ocean basins was a result of a plate divergence and uh, seafloor spreading uh, became recognized among geologists and some of the elements of plate tectonics became very popular in the, in the late 1960s. Well, what happened to the floor of the pre-flood ocean? That should be probably one of the primary questions that we should answer. Now, we don't have a lot of familiarity with the ocean floor directly, but we have all the geophysical data about the ocean floor. And as you look at the uh, Pacific Basin, for example, on this image of the Earth, you can see that it's not just a ring of fire with volcanoes around it, it is a basin of fire. Okay, but that, because that ocean floor is full of tens of thousands of volcanoes on the ocean floor called seamounts and guillotes. Maybe you've heard about those. And uh, there are volcanoes around the Pacific Rim, yes, but uh, the whole basin is uh, uh, volcanoes. And so the ocean floor is a volcanic feature dominated by vol uh, volcanic rocks. The typical rock is called basalt. And it's erupted, in, um, and, and the volcanoes erupt uh, basaltic lavas on Hawaii, and that, that's the kind of rock that the, the bottom of the ocean floor is made out of. Uh, the ocean crust is thick, but not as thick as the continents, uh, maybe 10 kilometers thick. The pre-flood Earth, let's talk about the, the pre-flood Earth, and I, I'll talk about the Earth's internal structure a little bit, about, uh, about the granitic continental lithosphere, about the basaltic oceanic lithosphere, and uh, here you see kind of the idea. Um, the Earth's internal structure can be divided into three different elements. The crust, which is uh, silicate rocks, typically a basalt or granite composition. The mantle rock, which is typically of a basaltic composition, but is rock, not molten. The outer core of the Earth is molten, we believe. The inner core is solid. And uh, so the majority of the Earth is mantle, the mantle of the Earth, and it's silicate rock. It's oxygen and silicon with magnesium and iron and other, uh, other elements like that. Uh, anyway, the mantle of the Earth is this uh, um, material that behaves like a rock in, in earthquakes. We, we know about its, uh, its properties indirectly, like from earthquakes. And we think we've found pieces of mantle that have been erupted uh, and quenched, and that gives us some ideas about the mineral structure down there. But anyway, the crust is uh, what we see, and the mantle is kind of largely concealed from us, but that's the major part of the Earth. And uh, what we need to think about is the crust and the mantle of the Earth to understand catastrophic plate tectonics. So if you look at the Grand Canyon, you'll see underneath the Grand Canyon, uh, the uh, crystalline rock in the, in the basement. There you see um, the, the Colorado River and you see the granite rocks down there, granitic rocks, Vishnu complex metamorphic rocks and Zoaster granite uh, that make this rock that's the basement of the continents. And the basement of the continents is this kind of rock uh, that's uh, widespread through uh, across uh, through the North American continent, but all continents have uh, this kind of rock as their their, uh, their dominant uh, rock type. This rock type is very different from the ocean floor rock. Now, we have lots of feldspar and lots of quartz in this rock. Mineral quartz is most distinctive of the granite rocks of the continent. Ocean rocks have very little quartz, the mineral quartz. They have some feldspar, but they have he more heavy minerals like uh, uh, hornblende and uh, pyroxene, things like that. And uh, granites tend to have biotite, mica, uh, that type of thing. A little bit different uh, chemistry and composition. Okay, well, granite in microscopic view, if you look at it, it's made out of three different uh, characteristic uh, minerals. Feldspar, 
which is the dominant mineral of the Earth's crust, quartz, which is a silicon dioxide mineral, and typically uh, mica or biotite, what's called uh, uh, iron mica. Ty those are typical uh, granite. And because of the, those uh, dominant minerals and because feldspar and quartz are the dominant uh, minerals of granite, uh, they, uh, th this rock has a density of about 2.8 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, 2.8 grams per cubic centimeter. In other words, it's 2.8 times the density of water. Okay, that's a good way to think about it. Okay, and uh, basalt in microscopic view, you see something different. You see the texture is finer, less crystalline, because it's typically quenched by contact with water or cooled differently. You'll see some larger minerals in there. Those are some feldspars. And um, also see um, minerals that are um, iron magnesium minerals, such as pyroxene and um, those kind of minerals. And because of the comp difference in composition, the basalt rock can be 2 point, probably 3.2 to 3.0 grams per cubic centimeter. So the density of granite is about 0.5 gram per cubic centimeter less than the density of basalt. So basalt is higher density, about uh, 3.2 grams per cubic centimeter and uh, the density of basalts uh, uh, are higher than, than for granite. Okay, why are there oceans? Okay, here's, here's the uh, <laughs> brief explanation. You see the continental crust there is, uh, the continental crust is thicker, thicker continental crust there, okay? And then the ocean crust is thin. And uh, think about the difference in density between continent and ocean floor. The, the thicker continents being lower density cause them to rise, okay, higher, and, the, and they displace the root of the mantle below into the root mantle below. The ocean crust is thinner but higher density, and so it floats lower but is not as thick. And so it allows the freeboard of the continents over the ocean basins. And the principle is like balsa wood floats higher in water than oak wood, right? Oak is higher density, so it floats deeper. And so you think about, the, think about that, the ocean crust, the oceanic crust, which is dominantly basalt, has higher density, it's thinner, so it floats lower on the mantle of the earth than the continental crust, which is uh, lower density and thicker. So it creates the freeboard. So the, uh, that's what I think it, it's like. And so the day before uh, the flood, what does the earth look like? It has basaltic crust, ocean floor, like we have today, probably largely gone. It has the same continental mass or crust that we have today, just recycled. The day before Noah's flood, we had a similar configuration as we do today, basalt and granite, different continental distribution, but we had the, the same continental composition. So the ocean basins were probably created on day three of creation week with this uh, different rock type. Uh, what was the physical cause of Noah's flood? Very good question. Internal uh, and ex external and internal uh, or uh, supernatural causes. You might think about this. Um, could the flood have caused itself inside the earth, an, in, in, uh, an internal cause? Or is there an external cause, like asteroid him hitting the earth or something? Or is there a supernatural cause, God pushing a button, releasing some trigger or something? Anyway, the, uh, that's something to think about, external or internal. Uh, Genesis 7, verse 11, uh, talks about the fountains of the great deep being broken up. So it has a tectonic theme to it, doesn't it? It has the Hebrew word beka, broken up or split open. And uh, uh, what are the effects of new hot ocean floor? Okay, a uh, new hot ocean floor was produced. And if, if plates were subducted, then we had new ocean floor formed. A new hot ocean floor may be different than that co cooler pre-flood ocean floor. Then we have spreading subduction and mantle-wide flow. Those are the processes that have to go on if plate tectonics is going to occur on an earth that doesn't expand. In other words, a constant volume earth. The initiation of the flood. Well, was it a supernatural mechanism, just the hand of God? 
or, or God slamming the door on the ark or something like that? Or is it an astronomical cause, like a comet, meteorite, asteroid, planet near miss, uh, something like that? Or is there something internal within the Earth, a terrestrial cause, like uh, something lighting off uh, radioactive decay and a heat buildup, or canopy collapse, or uh, some, some other trigger? Well, the initiation of the flood is described in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. That's the, the beginning of the flood. And it's a general seafloor upheaval, I believe, something uh, there uh, to it. The fountains of the great deep. Fountains is the Hebrew word mayin, which means water sources or springs of the great deep. Now, in the Hebrew, the word great deep is, stere is a stereotyped compound noun. There is no the in the original Hebrew. So fountains, great deep. And so the Hebrews had this very special significance that they at attached to the great deep. And the great deep is obviously a big ocean. Okay, and uh, so this great deep is uh, what they're referring to. So whatever the fountains of the great deep are, they were broken up, okay, and the windows of heaven were opened. Another cause of the flood was the, uh, the windows of heaven and uh, the unprecedented downpour of rain. Okay, so from the standpoint of Noah, he sees what? Looks out the window of the ark and he sees the windows of heaven are open. But the omniscient narrator that's giving us the text is telling us the fountains of the great deep is in there too. And it's mentioned first. So you see what I'm saying about that cause of the flood? So the origin of floodwaters, the situation before the flood, we had cold, dense uh, ocean crust. And we had uh, higher uh, granite uh, continents. Okay, so this cold, dense ocean floor is going to be replaced by what? Mantle rock that rises to form hot ocean floor of basaltic composition. You see what happens here? When you replace cold ocean floor with hot rock, what happens? It rises because hot crust is lower density than cold crust. If it's made out of the same material, mantle of the earth, it would, it would be warm or hot. And that what does that do naturally? It raises the floor of the ocean. And so we have internally within the earth a catastrophic mechanism to unload the continents or load the, uh, unload the ocean floor, uh, uh, unload the ocean onto the continents. Okay, the principles of uh, plate tectonics are three. We have spreading, we have subduction, and we have mantle-wide flow. Spreading, where two plates pull apart, okay, where two plates pull apart, what happens? It creates a gap, and in that gap, uh, mantle rock, plastic rock, can rise. And as it rises into that crack, it melts and then recrystallizes. And uh, that forms a new ocean floor. And as ocean floor spreads or uh, moves apart, you form a new rock in the crack. Okay, and then we have subduction, where mantle rock is receiving crust. As the crust falls, then it creates uh, subduction, and then the mantle is deformed, and you see mantle-wide flow. Plastic deformation can occur to rock on a large scale very rapidly. This has been modeled in some of these uh, experiments. Spreading subduction and mantle-wide flow. It happens in the mantle. Subduction is the process where the gap forms. Mantle-wide flow, all those arrows indicating the plastic deformation of the mantle. And then spread, okay, spreading, okay, so Subduction, we have spreading, we have mantle-wide flow. Okay, computer modeling of this catastrophic plate tectonics has been done on, a, on, on supercomputers, and it's done in three dimensions by, ma by modeling the mantle of the Earth. This was done with Los Alamos uh, supercomputers and a code called Terra, Terra Computational Mesh. And uh, the mantle of the Earth can be simulated, what's called finite element analysis, using a computer by breaking the Earth into um, a, a series of layers. A series of layers, you see here, the layers. And those layers have um, 
They're stacked up on top of one another. Each of those, those little uh, icosahedron layers, you see it looks like the, uh, the ceiling of a, a planetarium, the planetarium ceiling, you know, the geometry of that, that. That special geometry is used to simulate the mantle of the Earth. And then we can do, a def we can do deformation experiments on it. And anyway, uh, over this uh, uh, mantle uh, uh, 3D mesh, you can lay the continents. And you, could, and you could subduct the ocean floor. And so that's what's been done with this. And uh, millions of, uh, of, 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 of or, or hundreds of thousands of these little uh, uh, um, elements or cells of the mesh can be deformed. This is one of the, the experiments. It shows the uh, continental configuration, such as you see here. See. North America, Africa, South America, Antarctica, India, uh, you see Australia, and then you see Europe, Asia over here, Greenland, okay, and you have Tethys, this uh, pie-shaped thing here. That's the uh, initial configuration in this particular run. Um, whether that was the pre-flight configuration, I don't, I'm not so sure that's the right configuration, but in this deformation experiment, we cause the mantle, or we cause the ocean floor to unzip or deconnect from the continent around the, the western part, uh, the eastern part of the Pacific Basin and around the, the, the western part of the Pacific Basin and along here. And you see what happens. Uh, and when you tip this ocean floor, we believe it was cold, it's of the same composition of the pre flood mantle of the earth. What would happen? it could sink. In other words, we are modeling the uh, deformation of the Earth assuming that the, the pre-flood ocean floor was the same composition as the pre-flood mantle, just cooler. And the difference in temperature creates higher density of the ocean floor, and the ocean floor is able to be subducted and sink, like an aircraft carrier can sink in the ocean. Metal is higher density, it sinks. And so ocean floor could sink into the mantle. And we, in, the, in this numerical experiment, it's uh, detached along the margin of that supercontinent. In cross-section, you can see what's happening. You can see spreading occurring here. You see the cold ocean floor falling into the mantle of the Earth. And it's creating mantle-wide flow. And you see those little vectors showing you which way the mantle-wide flow is going. So, Spreading, okay, subduction, mantle-wide flow. Uh, here it is. Uh, 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 this is 40 days into the event. You see plates have descended almost uh, over halfway through the mantle of the Earth. Okay, 1,000 kilometers thickness, so that's fallen quite a, quite a distance. And you see over here it's fallen, and then the, the mantle-wide flow. The velocity of uh, this deformation as it accelerates goes up to a, about the maximum of two meters per second. In other words, these plates, we think, can fall about two meters per second into the mantle. The mantle is rock, and as, as the plates fall, there's a liquid uh, area around the, the plate as it descends, and that low viscosity, melted rock, allows the plate to accelerate to about two meters per second, a meter per second, as it falls into the mantle of the Earth. Here at, at, uh, the, at 60 days, you see what happens. The, there, there are crust, there's ocean crust that's fallen all the way to the core mantle boundary. The, ma the core of the Earth is higher density material. Uh, we think it's some kind of uh, alloy of iron and uh, sulfur or something like that. That uh, doesn't allow the silicate rock to, to penetrate. And so the bottom of the mantle contains a lot, large lithospheric junkyard of the pre-flood uh, ocean floor. And you see what's spread out there after 60 days. Whoops. And here you see uh, a mo uh, modeling the Earth. You can see the continent expressed. The topography is there. OK, what happens? The, 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 the continent is depressed around the edge, and then water invades. And you see the purple line is telling you where the uh, ocean actually invades. As this uh, subduction occurs along the, the eastern side of the Pacific uh, 
basin as that's subducted under the North American and, and uh, South American continents, what happens? The, the continent is depressed and water enters into the, water uh, goes uh, into the center of the continent. And of course the uh, hot rock is formed in the crack between the supercontinent as it opens and what do we see in there? That's the, probably the fountains of the great deep. Here it is at 60 days into the deformation experiment and you can see a significant part of the Atlantic Basin has been formed as the, the, the supercontinent breaks apart. And the Indian Ocean Basin is forming. And the vectors show, here's a vector view showing you the, the velocities that are attained. The maximum velocity here at about 60 days on the surface is about one meter per second. That's the velo uh, maximum velocity. If you think of Africa staying put, you can measure the velocities relative to other things. A polar view, you can see looking down on the Arctic Ocean as it's forming from the plates diverging. Again, uh, meter per second water vo uh, uh, maximum velocity. And uh, this is view from the South Pole. You're looking at Antarctica there. Okay, and here is the uh, uh, surrounding Antarctica. There's all that spreading going on. And we're looking at there's South America. There's Africa as the Atlantic Basin is forming. And then a large part of the Pacific Plate uh, pre-flood is being swallowed up. If you take an Earth, a, a globe, and hold it, you can see something very interesting. The, the ring of fire goes around the equator of the Earth, if you hold it that way, with with uh, Africa on the North Pole and the South Pacific Basin on the South Pole, North Pole being Africa, South Pole, if you hold it like that, the Pacific Basin or the, or the ring of fire goes around the Earth like an equator. And so that shows you something of the spherical geometry of how this plate uh, subduction occurred on that, er on that kind of Earth. And so you can actually see that uh, it is a straight line okay, across. And there's the Cordilleran deformation belt all the way through western North America into South America. The, uh, the Pacific Plate is moving um, this way. The North American Plate is moving away from Africa south and the resultant vector is like this. And so along California we have strike-slip faulting. We, we had a little bit of plate subduction due to uh, um, um, a, a plate boundary in here under Washington, but the primary motion of the North American plate and the Pacific plate creates this resultant that we have uh, a head-on collision in Alaska. Head-on collision of Pacific plate with Alaska. Uh, and uh, so you look at Alaska and you see the head-on collision place. You look down uh, in, in the western you, uh, um, 48 states and you'll see uh, Washington, Oregon, California, with this oblique collision, largely oblique collision. And so uh, the, the great mountains in the southern uh, part of Alaska, that would be Wrangell, St. Elias, Chugash Range, Kodiak Island, all of that is uh, related to this head-on collision. And so I love going to Alaska to see the head-on collision because of places like that. And here's the... Uh, um, there is uh, Bagley Ice Field. There's the, the mountains, uh, the Wrangell, uh, St. Elias Range. Here's the Chugash Range. Uh, these, these mountains in Alaska are the, uh, the features from the head-on collision. The uh, Andes Mountains, the same way. So I, I love uh, thinking and going to Alaska, doing that kind of thing. Okay, sediment transport with plate subduction occurring right, plate subduction occurring against a continent, what happens? A conveyor belt moves sediment from the ocean floor where? To the edge of the continent. It doesn't want to be subducted because it's low density. Uh, clay minerals and quartz and things like that are lower density. They don't want to go down with the plate. The cold plate can be subducted, but the sediment on the cold plate doesn't want to be subducted because it's low density. So we have a conveyor belt that moves sediment to the edge of continents. And then what, what is happening? We have tides and we have uh, huge waves generated by uh, the earthquake activity of the tectonics. 
So imagine a, a magnitude 8 or 9 earthquake here in western uh, Washington uh, due to plate subduction, and then imagine a continuous line of magnitude 8 or 9 earthquakes continuously for a year's period of time. Okay, that, that's the kind of thing you need to imagine if plate subduction is happening rapidly like we propose. Large rocks uh, are found in the bottom of Grand Canyon, big boulders like this 200-ton uh, uh, boulder, 20 feet in diameter, very, very uh, abundant. In the Kingston Range in Southern California, we have large blocks or mountain pieces that have slid. And uh, in this uh, illustration, I'm showing you a kilometer in thickness slab of rock which slid horizontally over the surface of the earth in a layer full of other broken pieces. This, I believe, is the beginning of the flood in the Mojave Desert. Uh, the Kingston Peak Formation contains the early flood deposits in the, in the, in the area. And okay, not only do you see uh, large uh, gravity collapse features like uh, the big boulder deposits, but we see supercurrents. And uh, evidence of flowing water creates a supercurrents. And these, these uh, sandstone layers, like at Zion National Park, have uh, this diagonally tilted layers called cross bedding. And cross bedding is, pr is a primary feature of many sandstone bodies, provide evidence of deep water, fast moving currents. Uh, not wind deposits, this is not a dune, this is deposited by water. We have water going over the continent at about a meter per second. That's what the stable velocity uh, 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 for forming uh, large underwater dunes. And these are called sand waves. They've been seen on smaller scale in tidal estuaries in the Golden Gate in San Francisco, uh, that place, but they're over widespread areas. And so continent. And there's a person there for scale. See the person right there for scale? So you get some idea. Those, these, are, these dunes are huge in the sand bodies and uh, provide evidence of fast moving water, about a meter per second water velocity, which is consistent with that meter per second uh, plate velocity. And over the North American continent, we have a buried sandstone layer called the Sauk Sequence. And there's a, there's a, san, a Cambrian sandstone that's in the Grand Canyon and in southwest uh, and, and eastern California that goes all the way up into North Greenland and around through uh, the mid, uh, middle part of the United States into uh, uh, Newfoundland area. And uh, it goes over, if you assemble Europe against it, it's in Scandinavia. And uh, around the Canadian shield is this giant blanket of sand. Could that be associated with the onset of the flood? As we look around, we see evidence of current in uh, volcanic ash deposits like the Painted Desert in uh, Arizona. Petrified Forest National Park should be called Petrified Log Jam National Park. You can see the, the, the very beautifully agatized logs that are, that are, that are there. Cell structure wood, bark pe uh, sometimes on or peeled off, roots and branches removed. Obviously, these things have been floated. And uh, so a great, uh, a great stranded mass of uh, ripped loose logs. And coal beds are what? They're, they're floating mats, aren't they? They have formed from floating mats. And that's been floated around and redeposited. And, uh, and then so coal is uh, and interlayered with uh, marine rocks. So it uh, looks like a marine flood was over Illinois in this case. And of course, we have the dinosaur deposits, like there at uh, Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, 1,500 bones on the, the quarry face, the quarry sandstone. And you see the way dinosaurs were buried in some type of slurry flow, like uh, uh, and, and very high con sediment concentration flow. Not a normal river deposit that buried these dinosaurs. And uh, in uh, Texas, we see here a three foot thick layer of, um, of what? Clams, clam fossils dominantly, whole clams. Okay, how did whole clams get buried? The, the muscles and ligaments were holding the shell shut. You know, when clams die on the beach, they fall apart. The, the hinging ligament pops the shell open, natural tendency. When uh, the muscles are in there that holds the valves, uh, two valves of the clam shut. So rapid burial, uh, I see that all around us. Volcanism and earthquake, let's talk about uh, 
uh, how uh, magnetism is preserved. When a rock cools from a molten condition, uh, lava flow cools, it, at the moment it, it crystallizes at a certain temperature, it records the magnetic field of the Earth. We have a lot of reversely magnetized rocks and normally magnetized rocks, and it appears that the Earth's magnetic field has flipped during Noah's flood. And this idea has led us to understand uh, that large masses of seafloor are reversely magnetized, and this uh, magnetism um, was imprinted rapidly. Like on Steen's Mountain, one lava flow has two different directions. And that indicates that the Earth's magnetic field, within a week or so, can reverse. And uh, so a loop of magnetic flux probably created at the core mantle boundary can, um, can transit through the mantle of the Earth to the crust and, and be imprinted in the lava flows. And so the probably plate subduction is one of the processes that initiated the reversal of the Earth's magnetic field. And around this Pacific Basin, we have the Ring of Fire, the Pacific Basin, but it's really the Basin of Fire, isn't it? We have all of these earthquakes and all the volcanoes. Anyway, you, you can see where the modern earthquakes are. They're in uh, belts around the basin, and that's where the plate subduction occurred. And so we're seeing the residual effects of the ancient plate subduction. Okay, let's talk about the termination of the flood, the statements of Scripture the accommodation space made for the ocean, the beveled surfaces of the continents. And the waters retreated from the earth, going and retreating, and the waters were going and falling until the tenth month, a literal uh, rendition of Genesis 8.3 and Genesis 8.5. Well, the, the flood of the, uh, the scribe in the Bible, the waters were coming and going, or going and retreating, so it's an oscillatory motion, it seems like. And the waters were coming and going until the 10th month. So the middle of the flood, at the end of five months, this uh, unusual six months, the end of six months, this unusual going and retreating is happening until the 10th month. So it's, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a large amount of that. And if you look at, the, uh, uh, look at the surface of the Colorado Plateau, you can see it's beveled off. And the beveling of the retreat of the waters of the flood seems obvious. To me, the canyon was formed uh, in the post-flood period. The, the, the retreat of the floodwaters was generally over a sheet-like area, and so it beveled off the, the top of the plateau. Okay, so post-flood uh, geologic process. We have uh, tectonics, we have volcanism, we have sedimentation, we have erosion, uh, global cooling. And the post-flood world cooled, and uh, the intensity of geologic process declined. And uh, the, uh, uh, the raininess of, of the post-flood world declined to the present arid earth. And then we had an ice age. So we, a lot of things are happening in the post-flood world. So exponential decline of process in the post-flood world from the, the, the very high, uh, very potent geologic processes that were initiated by the, the flood uh, and the catastrophic process during the flood year. And that's largely... Um, in, in uh, exponential decline in the post-flood period. So when Noah got out of the ark, uh, there was a rainbow, but it wasn't just uh, happy, uh, business-like uh, normal. There was a, a, a world that was still uh, in significant geologic change. And I don't blame them for wanting to stick around at the Tower of Babel rather than go out over uh, some large areas of the earth because there were still a lot of things happening out there. Well, uh, in the, in the post-flood world, lots of things were happening. Think about this. Those plates that were subducted under the continents stopped subducting and or slowed very much to the present. And then things rose and fell, subsidence and uplift, loading and unloading. The, uh, uh, and so the vertical tectonics and isostasy, that's the principle of equal pressure with depth, allowed uh, the uh, uh, certain parts of the continent to sink and other parts to rise. Ocean floor is, it was hot, right? And what happens when hot ocean floor cools? It becomes higher density and sinks. And so in the post-flood period, the cooling ocean floor 
uh, as it cools, it sinks. And so what happens? The continents appear to rise relative to the ocean. And so in the post-flood period, it looks like the continents are emerging out of uh, the ocean. And that's what we, we indicate and see. We see these uh, giant uh, folded uh, rock strata layers. Here's some people for scale. If you look at the base of that cliff, you can see the, the people, people down there. Okay, and sandstone is twisted like taffy. This is the rise of uh, the upwarp in northern Arizona called the Kaibab upwarp. And the upwarp occurred in the late flood, so-called Laramide orogeny, and this uh, created the monocline called the East Kaibab upwarp, and that feature created the blockage that allowed water to pond behind it and allowed a big lake to build up. And that lake was later breached uh, its dam and became Grand Canyon. Lots of volcanic features to talk about. Uh, shield volcanoes and composite cone volcanoes like Mount Rainier, Mount Baker, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams. Down in Oregon, we have uh, Mount Hood. Okay, cinder cone volcano, lots of lava flows, things like that. Calderas like Crater Lake. And uh, so magma, especially magmas here in the, uh, uh, under uh, the western United States, are expressing themselves late in the flood and in the post-flood period. Uh, large plutons of granite, like in the Andes Mountains, are, have cooled. Uh, we see out in eastern Oregon, like in the John Day country, great uh, masses of volcanic ash, John Day formation, Clarno formation, overlain by the Columbia River basalts. And so uh, giant flood basalts in the post-flood, early uh, post-flood period just oozing out and large uh, linear fracture systems. And the buildup of deltas, like this is the, this is the uh, Nile River Delta. And the Missi Mississippi River Delta, that's been prospected for oil, and it's a deep delta. Many miles in thickness of sediment has been accumulated there in the post-flood period. And a canyon erosion, like a Palouse River Gorge here in Washington State, 400 feet deep, several hundred feet wide, uh, six miles long, gouged out by what? The, the great glacial flood from the broken ice dam there in Missoula, Montana, Lake Missoula flood. And the Cordillane area in Idaho, that was a great ice dam there that broke. And uh, Grand Canyon was breached by the, the lake, that, or series of lakes that were there on the Colorado Plateau. So you can imagine uh, various lakes on the Colorado Plateau, the dam, through the Kaibab upwarp in northern Arizona failed, and this lake, this lake drained, creating um, a, a canyon. And then more lakes up here, that Canyonlands Lake failed, and other lakes failed. And so the, the, the falling like dominoes of lakes created canyons like Grand Canyon. Post-flood climate, it was a hot ocean in the Arctic, okay? So there's evidence of exponential cooling of the oceans. There's increased rain and snow just after the flood because of the hot oceans, and that's coo the cooled, ocean, cooled oceans now created the onset of glaciation. And then the, we live in a, an arid earth. We, we have big deserts on the earth today. And uh, we live in uh, the present earth. And so the earth has cooled. And there's global cooling on a global scale indicated by the seafloor data for example, the oxygen isotope data of the, uh, in the Arctic Ocean. And uh, so w there was a warmer ocean up there, and it's cooled off. So in just in the thousands of years since the flood, the ocean has cooled, and it created this precipitation. And uh, Dr. Larry Vardaman has modeled the, the raininess that occurs when you have a hot ocean. And the cooling earth uh, creates uh, this ice age naturally. So what do you need to have uh, to have an ice age? You need heat and you need cold. You need uh, hot oceans and you need cooling, global cooling. And the cooling creates this, uh, uh, this ice age. And uh, so precipitation uh, allows uh, the buildup. And you can see uh, there's North America and you can see lots of ice and glacier uh, precipitation. Uh, so the, the whole global circulation pattern has changed at, at, during the Ice Age, and then following, we're living in the after effects of this uh, global Ice Age. 
and the global ice age occurred and now we have a little bit of global cooling uh, warm and warming and left things like Yosemite Valley, beautiful a valley, U-shaped valley which was filled with glaciers. Now uh, the, the glacier is largely absent just in the upper uh, part of the drainage basin but there was a huge glacier that was in Yosemite and uh, in many of the, uh, the higher mountain areas uh, here in Washington State. And then uh, we have the distribution of animals after the flood, the distribution of animals, and like the elk, right? The elk and the blast zone are amazing. Think, think about those elk. We, we thought that they were a forest-dwelling animal, that they would have problem in the blast zone of Mount St. Helens because they have that thick hide. What are they going to do in the summer when they can't find shade? They're going to die of heat exhaustion. But what happens? They found that there's a cooling behavior. Elk like to cool themselves in wet soil, and they go in to uh, take a siesta, <laughs> and uh, they uh, do fine. In fact, uh, more elk in the blast zone, I think, than in the surrounding uh, forests at Mount St. Helens. So, the, so uh, elk are um, amazingly versatile animals. And so we imagine uh, all kinds of animals distributing widely in the post-flood period. And then, uh, of course, the earth became more arid. Okay, the raininess declined, and now we live, we have great deserts like the Sahara Desert. But the Sahara Desert was once a lake. There's lake sediments underneath the sand of the Sahara. And uh, great uh, river valleys were opened, and uh, um, a, a drainage of lakes created uh, canyons. And there's the, uh, uh, there's, uh, the, the earth, uh, the, the post-flood earth. Distribution of continents, present distribution of continents. Um, boy, there's a lot of things that plate tectonics explains. And in this complicated graphic, uh, I, can, I can point to some things that, that catastrophic plate tectonics explains. And uh, it has great explanatory power. And because of a global worldview involving the flood and plate tectonics, I like to think this way about the Earth. And so uh, I've integrated plate tectonics into my flood model, and I hope you can understand a little bit about what, uh, what that's like. But uh, uh, earthquake focal mechanisms, earthquake distribution globally, uh, these big uh, faults, detachment faults especially, that make up mountains, that fits nicely with my view of plate tectonics. Uh, the way uh, the, the, the magnetism in rocks is, uh, polar wandering, the magnetic striping of the ocean floor, uh, the details of how it's imprinted on the rock, uh, that's interesting. And um, um, lots of things dealing with uh, the, the continent shape, fossil distribution, ocean geology, um, boy, the ridges of the ocean floor, um, the, the mantle uh, velocity anomalies, especially on the, on the sea floor, or pardon me, on the, on the base of the mantle. That sit, fits nicely with plate tectonics. Uh, mineral phases in the earth, uh, like to think that way. Uh, plate tectonics sits, sits nicely. Uh, the temperature trends uh, after the flood, uh, ice age. I mean, we need a mechanism for the ice age, having really hot oceans. Plate tectonic, uh, mo uh, catastrophic plate tectonics, that fits nicely. Uh, the, the distribution of continental rocks, uh, and deposition of, of the sandstone layers makes sense. Thick and widespread deposits of uh, especially sand and mud of really distant uh, locations. Flood basalts like here in Washington. Kimberlites or erupted uh, diamond bearing pipes from the mantle of the earth. Those things are catastrophic. Uh, the, uh, the actual source and destiny of the flood water sit, fits nicely with plate tectonics models. The source of the the floodwaters is just the simple uh, uh, pre-flood earth and the lifting of those ocean floor rocks by the replacement with new hot ocean floor rocks unleashed the ocean on the continent. And it's a rather simple explanation to get rid of the floodwaters from off of the earth. Just have that ocean floor, new ocean floor form cool and it changes its density. Um, there's enough energy in the pre-flood ocean floor to be subducted. The gravitational potential energy of the cold ocean floor is about right to uh, um, unleash the, the flood 
on the earth. Windows of heaven can be uh, related to uh, seafloor volcanism. The fountains of the great deep can be accommodated within this model. And uh, things, other, other kind of things are all, all out there. So that's uh, global tectonics in a, and plate tectonics. Thank you. The Bible talks about no rain before the flood and heavy rain during the flood and then rain continuing uh, after the flood. Your model with oceans uh, and so forth before the flood would have given rain before the flood because you had oceans, evaporation off the oceans, and then any wind of any kind to move it over land, you would have had some rain before uh, the flood. Also, uh, okay, shifting, well, I, shift, I only have two. The other one's the shifting of the Earth's axis. Uh, if the Earth's axis wasn't shifted, it would contribute to no rain. The Earth's axis being shifted is a significant contributor to the rain patterns we have today. And uh, could you explain those two? <laughs> okay. Uh, diff uh, I'm not so sure that we have all of the uh, all the facts here right, but uh, we had oceans before the flood, and uh, what does that scripture, so it's basically a dominant, uh, is, a, is a scripture problem. You want to talk to Larry Varnum about those issues, okay? That's who you want to talk to. You don't want to talk to me. I'm into tectonics of plate motion, not into uh, uh, the atmospheric modeling uh, in the, in, in the pre-flood period, but uh, we had oceans. Now, what, what, what was the rain condition like? Let, 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 I'll let somebody else answer that, that particular question. Um, but I don't know what the scripture says. And then uh, how about the, sh the axis of the earth? The axis of the earth is now tilted 23 and a half degrees relative to the, uh, um, the plane of the orbit around the sun. Okay, and that's about optimum for creating the, 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 the climate distributions that we have in the, in, on the planet. And I think the Earth's rotation or the, the axis of rotation hasn't changed significantly relative to its orbit. I think that's remained largely fixed. I think the rotation rate of the Earth has slightly accelerated due to the, due to the, uh, uh, the, the subduction of the ocean floor. The Earth's rotation rate has sped up slightly, like a, like a skater pulling in her arms, you know, it spins faster. So the, the Earth's uh, the day has changed a little bit, but uh, not much change in the axis. Yes. Um, yeah, I had a question. I, I believe Genesis 7 says that the fountains of the great deep bro were broken up all in the same day. That's something? Um, so I'm trying to understand what mechanism caused uh, the oceans to become torrential rain. Okay. Um, um, well, the... The, the scripture says all the fountains of the great deep were broken up on that same that same day, right? So one day, so it seems like that unzipping that would happen. See, fl ocean floor has to detach from continent and start to be subducted. It looks like that unzipping process happened very rapidly around the the, the pre-flood uh, supercontinent, essentially. So that and and and. Uh, so we had a, uh, a global earthquake event that was created. Okay, that, that's what that's what seems to seems to be apparent there. And um, how does that relate to the rain? Okay, uh, that I can't say. Uh, my, my my guess is the new ocean floor that was created uh, and the hot rock that were formed caused the rain. And uh, and there could also be uh, moisture in the atmosphere, even a canopy ready to to. to Condense. Okay, question here. Uh, Dr. Austin, you showed a graph where you showed the, um, the ocean temperatures. I was wondering how you collected the data or where you got it. And the second thing is if you could comment on the magnetic, magnetic field change that's currently occurring mm -hmm. and what the different theories or ideas are behind that. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, that, uh, that exponential decline curve showed oxygen 18 ratio in uh, little uh, small uh, um, organisms in the Arctic Ocean core, okay? And that, 
uh, th that oxygen 18 oxygen ratio is, is indicative of temperature. And so we think we had a hot ocean, maybe 80 degrees, or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, even warmer than that uh, in the Arctic. What would that create? Just think, think that way. And you can imagine what the ice age must have been like. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about hot oceans after the flood. And so this, the hot ocean phenomena uh, and the cooling of that ocean went through that exponential decline and it created the ice age. The ice age is a natural byproduct of the hot ocean. And maybe uh, Dr. Varnum will explain a little more about that. Okay, question over here. Um, around Washington State, we have these really thick basalt layers. You don't have to go far to, to see all the basalt. I'm wondering if your model would show that as being um, post or current flood catastrophe, or is that more of a sign of erosion, like the, those basalt layers being put there by lava from cataclysmic, or is that eroded away and exposing it uh, to us currently? Okay, in when plates were subducted under western Washington, it flexed Washington State and created tension away out there in eastern Washington. And uh, at the end of the flood, there was a whole bunch of fractures that were still there. And uh, when the plates slowed down, it created opening of those fractures. We had a linear fissure array that reached down to the mantle of the earth. But over there, there was no subducted ocean sediment. So there's no uh, andesite or andesitic composition magma. There's just basalt down there, basaltic rock. And so it rose to the surface. And it flooded, what, uh, a quarter million square mile area, creating the uh, lava flood terrain of the, the Columbia River Plateau. So uh, yeah, lava flood. Largely in the late, just in the late flood and into the post flood is when all those volcanic uh, activities happening. Okay, and one one last question over here. Okay, yes. Last question before. Yeah, last hi, question. hi, Dr. Austin. Uh, I was wondering what's going on with the FAST project, and uh, what what can, what can we expect you guys to come out with in the next uh, in the coming okay. coming days. Right. Okay. Uh, FAST project. Then we need to break here. Um, flood activated sedimentation and tectonics. It's a program. Okay. Flood activated sedimentation and tectonics is the program research program is currently going on with about six scientists, six projects that are working on supercurrents. The evidence of those sandstone layers showing uh, the great cross bedding. Okay, supercurrents, the Coconino Sandstone Project. Um, and uh, there's another project on, uh, uh, a series of projects on super flow. And I'm into super flows, right? And other people on the, on the FAST program are into super flows. How uh, sediment can flow over essentially horizontal surfaces and fly like wings under the ocean and deposit thick masses of sedimentary rocks, like the limestone layer in the Grand Canyon with the nautiloids, that kind of thing. Uh, slurry flow in uh, Kingston Peak Formation, which I showed pictures of in Mojave Desert. Slurry flow in Alaska, where the plates were colliding head-on. What is a head-on collision going to cause in Alaska? Huge uh, collapse and flow deposits, and so that's what we've been looking for. And then evidence of super faults. That's the other thing that FAST is doing, super faults. Uh, today, when, when earthquake activity occurs and faults slip, what happens? We pulverize rock, we make rock powder. But in the catastrophic plate tectonics, when, when rock faulted and slipped, it slipped great distances and it slipped at about meter per second it melted rock. Faults can melt rock. We have no modern earthquakes that melt rock, okay, but we had earthquakes in the past in this tectonic process that created melted rock. So the FAST program is studying the melted rock on faults as evidence of catastrophic plate tectonics. That's, that's kind of what FAST is doing.